Excellent. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I imagine a few folks will continue to trickle in, but uh, we're very excited about this uh, webinar on methanol. My name is Randall Krantz. I'm a senior advisor on decarbonization at the Global Maritime Forum, and I've been part of the Getting to Zero Coalition since the, its beginning um, uh, uh, two and a half years ago, which is very exciting. Uh, this webinar is part of a series that we're doing from the Fuels and Technologies Workstream, and we're looking at a range of different fuels. We've had webinars on, uh, on hydrogen as a cargo. We've had webinars on uh, biofuels. We've had webinars on ammonia. And this webinar is on methanol as a scalable zero emissions fuel uh, for the maritime sector. Uh, so we're very excited about this webinar. We really were going to be exploring the scalability potential of uh, and the different uh, feedstock pathways um, that will allow us to get to the carbon that we needed to make uh, the future methanol that we'll be needing. Um, and so we'll be exploring uh, a few different things, including methanol synthesis from, from biomass, the use of uh, carbon captured from different point sources, including combustion of biomass on land, for example, but also capturing carbon from the atmosphere using direct air capture technologies, and then how these can be synthesized and used um, in an e-methane or a, a renewable methane fuel. Um, this uh, session will be one hour long, and I'm really excited that uh, we have some great panelists. So we have with us uh, from IRENA, we have Dolph Gielen, who's the Director of Innovation and uh, Technology Center. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Rob Zeller, uh, Vice President of Technology at 1.5, um, which is uh, uh, a company that is working on direct air capture very specifically to be making future fuels. We have uh, Carolina Bat-Holden, um, uh, uh, who is uh, head of uh, public policy and business uh, development uh, at a group called Liquid Wind based out of uh, Sweden. And we have Jakob Sterling, head of technical innovation at AP Moller Maersk. Uh, the format of this webinar is going to be very interactive. So as, uh, as our speakers are talking, um, please put your questions into the chat. Um, grateful if you put them so that they go to everyone, because if they just go to the hosts and panelists, then uh, your uh, fellow colleagues who are uh, watching with you might not see your questions. We'll do our best to repeat those, and we'll be uh, doing our best to incorporate any questions that you ask into the conversation so that this is not us talking to you, but us talking with you and engaging in a style where we can all learn as much as we can about methanol, about its uses in the maritime sector. So what I'd like to do is turn to each of our speakers for some opening remarks, a little bit of context and uh, scene setting. Um, and first, uh, Dolph, I will turn to you. Um, Dolph, uh, you've worked uh, at Arena for some time and you guys have worked uh, extensively on methanol and published uh, several reports uh, on the topic. So over to you to set the scene on methanol as a, a scalable zero emission marine fuel. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Randall. And um, I'll focus especially on e-methanol, but I, of course, can't leave out a few words also about biomethanol. So that's the two main uh, uh, production uh, routes for, let's say, clean uh, methanol. And um, so we, we, we've worked on, on renewable methanol production. We also recently did a report on uh, capturing carbon in our series on, on reaching zero with renewables, uh, where we also look at the BECs and DAC, and I'll, I'll also come to that uh, aspect. Um, and uh, we also look at the shipping uh, applications. Um, so the basics, the chemical basics, to make uh, E-methanol, you need hydrogen and you need CO2. And for a ton of, of e-methanol, you need about, in, in the theoretical best case, 200 kilos of hydrogen, 1.4 tons of CO2. And, and these, these numbers are important because uh, they, you can already do a back of envelope calculation. If you see that, that we're talking about one and a half dollars per, per kilo of hydrogen, and you need 200 kilos, so you multiply the two, that's $300. Uh, if you look at the, 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 the amount of CO2 you need, the 1.4 tons, if it's $100 per ton, that's $140. And uh, at the same time, we know that methanol price today is, is $300, $400 per ton. So 
it gives you a sense of, of what we're so so theoretically we can get to these levels but uh, right now we're, we're very far from these uh, levels um let's see if i can move the slides voilà. there we go so um we to today's methanol production volume 100 million tons we see 2050 potential up to 500 million tons uh, that uh, uh, includes a big part of e-methanol what we're talking about uh, today uh, the uh, in, in terms of applications uh, we see important uh, shipping application uh, but still we see we see ammonia as the dominant uh, shipping clean shipping fuel going forward but all these numbers are, are i would say quite uncertain still there are, there are pluses and minuses to different fuels i will not go into that detail uh, uh, for the for the uh, discussion uh, today so as I said, today's costs, here you see a cost comparison today and, and for mature production for, for on the right hand side for the green, for the, for the biomethanol, on the left hand side for the e-methanol. So you see that uh, right now e-methanol is a lot more expensive. Uh, and uh, let's say for, for today's cost, uh, the, the green hydrogen cost is a critical cost component. You see that the, the mature production cost levels are in the same ballpark for both. And what is interesting is that the, um, the, the, the consideration, the economics are very different. So for the, for the, for the biomass, as you produce more, you need more and more of that scarce feedstock. So the cost will go up. For the blue one, as you produce more and more, you have the economies of scale in the production technologies and the cost will go down. So, so that makes that the economics are very different. A second uh, aspect is, so if, if you make the e-methanol, the, the e you have two, two ways to do that. You can use, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll get to the, the biomass sourcing. You, you can use, um, let's say, fossil uh, uh, CO2 sources, power plant or an industrial plant, in which case you reduce overall CO2 emissions somewhere in the order of 35% or in the best, very best case, 50%, which is significant, but which is overall not net zero. If you really want net zero, then you need to use either a biomass CO2 source or you use direct air capture. And uh, right now, direct air capture is a lot more expensive. So let's say $500 per ton of CO2. There are projections out there that we can get, and I think we'll hear about that, that we can get to too much lower levels. Uh, I've seen levels of, of 50 to $150 per ton of CO2 long-term. The, the biomass CO2 sources are today a lot cheaper. So if you have an, 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 an ethanol plant, uh, if you have a biomass power plant, uh, we're talking $50, $150 per ton of CO2, but then the cost reduction potential is, of course, much more limited. So um, it, these two components, the, 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 the hydrogen supply cost and the uh, uh, CO2 cost are, are key components for the overall cost going forward. And as I already mentioned that the CO2 impacts can be quite uh, different. Now, fr from, a, from a project siting perspective, it's, it's interesting that um, the lowest cost hydrogen you find in a desert. But uh, of course, that's usually not where you have the biomass CO2. So, um, 
it's then a question, where do you cite? And, and, and I've heard some, some producers say, well, we prefer to be in a desert because we think that cheap cost hydrogen is more important than, than, than cheap cost CO2. Somehow we will figure out this DAC, DAC uh, component. So uh, th th that's, that's, let's say, complicates it a little bit further. And okay, it, it, there's also some critique. So there's not sufficient biomass CO2 available. Well, if you look at the numbers for Europe, there's quite a lot of biomass CO2. So uh, uh, the, 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 the amounts to do something significant would be there. So um, all of this, I think, <clears throat> Uh, would require a little bit more research, but this is this concludes my initial remarks. Thank you very much, Dolph. Thank you for the um, uh, chemistry 101 behind uh, methanol. Obviously, we're not all chemists on this call, but it's important to understand at least what our feedstock is, what we're, what our building blocks are. In this case, two very important ones, hydrogen and CO2. And we spoke about, or you spoke about uh, the two different sources of this, one of those being direct air capture, which of course is a perfect segue to Rob, uh, you to talk to us a little bit about um, um, uh, what your aspirations are at 1.5, how you see the landscape, and maybe you can offer some more detailed comments on some of the numbers that uh, Dolph was uh, presenting. Great, let me see if I can share my screen. How's that working? Perfectly, thank you. Great. So. Uh, most of you have never heard of 1.5, and 1.5 is really tied to carbon engineering, which is one of the, the major uh, direct air capture technology companies out there, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So let me spend a lot of time going through this uh, legal disclaimer. Uh, I'm kidding. All right, I'm just throwing it up there. I'm going to move on. So who is 1.5? We have a, a, we're a development company, and, and basically we have the skills to, to do very large projects. Uh, we have the, the discipline to build things and to execute projects on time and on budget. And so we have a license to build carbon engineering's direct air capture technology in the United States. Um, we're positioned to support industries that have historically been tough to decarbonize. And our mission again is to commercialize direct air capture at scale to, cur to curb the global warming at 1.5 and thus our name 1.5. So DAC to fuels, and I'm gonna use DAC in a little bit of different ways. Um, it's really a large scale solution. Uh, we believe it's scalable through uh, removal combined with clean hydrogen to form what we call as a, carb, a circular carbon energy cycle. And I'll show a, a chart on that. Carbon engineering has a trademark name called air to fuels. Um, essentially it's taking their direct air capture out of their technology, converting that uh, with uh, green hydrogen and uses Fisher Tropes process to produce a, uh, a portfolio of products from jet to diesel to gasoline, depending on how you run your Fisher Tropes. In, in our mind, uh, DAC to fuels, if you have a drop in replacement, it minimizes port infrastructure changes, any short sort of ship conversion costs. So it has an advantage compared to say uh, hydrogen and uh, ammonia approaches in that you can do a drop in replacement and not have to do all those other costs. And so whenever you look at a, in, in our mind, uh, cost and economics, for as part of a transition. I, I don't know if you can go to one ultimate solution, but I think you're gonna to have to have a transition over time so that the economics work out uh, in the most optimal way. And in power to liquids, and there's a variety of different things. Right? You, mostly that is converting it to syngas. And then once you have syngas, you can convert it to a lot of different things from methanol, diesel, low carbon fuels, dimethyl ether, whatever. Uh, but converting it to carbon monoxide or syngas is really the key. Uh, this is, uh, I want to spend a little bit of time on, on how we see direct air capture being part of a, a future net zero or net uh, negative world. Starting off on the left, we have um, uh, missions free power feeding both direct air capture and potentially the point source capture of different emissions. And when we see direct air capture, it can do a lot of different things. And again, if, if we believe that direct air capture is going to be part of the solution and, 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 uh, and, it, and there could be different steps of that solution from a transition perspective. Director capture can remove historical emissions, just like plants do. 
except plants and trees don't remove CO2 fast enough for what we need the world to go do. So it can remove historical emissions. It also allows us to set up a circular carbon energy cycle to support maritime, for example, where the CO2 is, re is removed from the air, converted to energy using a couple different processes, and then reused by the, the, by the maritime industry, thus forming the circular carbon energy cycle. It also complements point source capture for example, if you have an industrial port or an industrial point source emitter, you can't capture 100% of that CO2. Uh, it's just not economically possible. There's always slip in the different processes. So you can use point source capture to, to basically get to a net zero by, by providing offsets and, or, or credits associated with geological sequestration of that CO2. And, and finally, it supports uh, industries such as, uh, and, and let's look at the, uh, the maritime industry. If you take CO2 out of the atmosphere and offset the, uh, the emissions associated with, with fossil and use the atmosphere as a virtual pipeline, there could be a more economic solution as we transition to a more sustainable future. The point being that direct air capture is very versatile and it, uh, as we scale it up. Now, the cost that you had quoted there, uh, Dolph, uh, I think those are high. I think that's a competitor price that have published those prices. Um, the, the carbon engineering technology, I mean, we're building a million metric ton per year facility. That's going to make 20,000 barrels a day type of number of methanol if we chose to convert all of that to methanol. And so the, the carbon engineering technology is really a scalable industrial type process. And what's cool about it is you, to, to cite these things, you put it right on top of good geological storage, or you put it on places like in the desert, as you had said, where you have a lot of sunshine and make a lot of uh, uh, green electrons to generate hydrogen. That's another approach. So there's different ways of, of approaching it, but the, uh, the flexibility associated with uh, direct air capture really is uh, something I wanted to highlight. And, and that's it. Excellent. Thank you, um, Robin. We'll come back to, to some of those questions around kind of the, um, the, the, the scalability and how that relates to the industry what percentage of the industry we're looking at uh, that can potentially uh, covered by this. Um, in terms of your comments on offsets, I think one of the uh, important things uh, that everybody understands is that when we're looking at this um, for the purposes of this webinar and for the work of the Getting to Zero Coalition, we're looking at potential for insetting in terms of um, uh, re carbon reductions that are in the same uh, boundary system, what we're looking at. And, and that's, um, important to note because there's ongoing conversations about uh, the potential role of offsets versus insets in, in, in other industries and shipping so far has really been looking only at insetting and not offsetting. And so the goal here is how do we ensure that we're reducing emissions within the shipping industry and obviously direct air capture and the production of methanol um, through the synthesis process is, is an opportunity for us to be able to do that. Now, so that's from the direct air capture side. Um, from a biogenic side, um, there is uh, more chemistry to come, I'm sure. Um, but Carolina, maybe you can take us through what um, Liquid Wind is doing um, and uh, what your uh, the scales that you foresee um, for this uh, for this potential. Yes, thank you, Randall, and thank you for the opportunity to join today. Um, so. As mentioned, I'm Caroline and I work with public policy and business development at Liquid Wind. And I'm happy to share a bit more of what, who we are and, and our ambitions. Just gonna see if I can change slide. There we go. Okay, good. So Liquid Wind uh, is a Swedish company founded in 2000. 2017 by my colleague Klaus Fredriksson and we develop, finance and build uh, facilities to produce green methanol uh, or also called electromethanol. Our liquid fuel is produced by combining green hydrogen which we get from renewable electricity with CO2 which we capture from biogenic emitting sources such as paper and pulp mills or CHP plants that are burned on biomass. So in comparison to, um, to direct air capture, we, we capture it from, from already existing uh, point sources. 
And our concept is to build standardized facilities, each one producing 50,000 tons of e-methanol per year, upcycling 70,000 tons of CO2. And by replacing fossil fuels with e-methanol, we can replace or, pre or prevent 100,000 tons of CO2 emissions per year and facility. And the reason we, why we wanna work with standardized facilities is because we wanna be able to replicate fast. Today, we are working on our first facility in the north of Sweden, which will be up and running in 2024. By 2030, we plan to have 10 more facilities in place, um, mostly focused in Scandinavia, but also other parts of Europe, before we then expand further. And while e-methanol can be used to power trucks or it can also be used in the chemical sector, uh, Liquid Wind's focus is, is on the marine sector where we see a great demand for, for a liquid fuel, which is easy to transport, to use and to store. And having methanol itself as an already approved fuel by the IMO uh, with low local emissions such as SOX and NOx, uh, there's also a good opportunity to blend green methanol with fossil methanol, enabling a smoother transition. And I'm quite sure you're well aware of this, um, but the sector is, is far from regulated when it comes to CO2 emissions, where nearly 100% of the fuel is fossil based. Um, which means we have a lot to do. We have a lot of fossil fuels to replace and we are in great need of scalable fuel solutions such as e-methanol. What I think is very positive is that we can see increasing ambitions within the industry and from different players. We have, for example, Mashk, who is here today as well, um, IKEA, um, Amazon, all sending right signals to customers and, and other parts of the industry. What I think is very important is, is that we as an industry come together and also push uh, for policy support and interim instruments enabling a greener transition. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, uh, Carolina. Um, some, some interesting points there. One quick question just to follow up. Um, you used the term on one of your slides, upcycling uh, CO2. Just, just to be clear what you mean by upcycling in this context. So what I mean with upcycling is actually capturing CO2 from, from um, an emitting, emitting source uh, to use it for the production of e-methanol. So we capture it and use it in the production. Um, and then it is emitted again um, yes. when we burn the fuel. Okay, and, and I was asking for that clarification, um, partly for me, but partly for those um, who are joining us. Yes. One of the important yeah. things to note is that there's obviously there's um, uh, different ways of, of doing this. There's an option that we're not discussing today, which is kind of the carbon capture and use option. So this could be if you're taking, for example, an industrial process such as a steel mill, um, which is using a fossil source of carbon, it would be possible to capture that carbon um, and that carbon could be synthesized into fuel, but it's important to note that that wouldn't give us a zero emission fuel. You're essentially then splitting that carbon between you know, two different industries and uh, lowering your effective emissions by half overall. And so that's, for those that are on uh, joining us today, that's one of the reasons that we're not talking about that as an option because it doesn't actually get us to where we need to be. Um, but one of the companies that is working on getting us to where we need to be, um, uh, Jakob from Maersk, uh, obviously I think most uh, who have joined us will know that you have placed uh, some uh, some orders for interesting uh, methanol powered vessels, and you're in the process of sourcing where that methanol is going to uh, come from. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what you're doing and what your aspirations are and why the scalability is so important for what you're doing. Yes, uh, I'd be happy to, to sort of give some background to, to some of the decisions we have taken this year uh, and, and how, we, how we see methanol in that context. And uh, I'll just try and see if I can share my screen. Um, has it, uh, is it showing it? Yes, perfect, thanks. Perfect. All right, I'll jump straight to the next uh, slide. Um, our, our journey on finding fuels for, for shipping and for Maersk uh, 
basically started three years ago when we set our, our target to, com- to become uh, carbon neutral in 2050. Because when we set that target, uh, we quite frankly didn't know uh, how to get there. We just knew that this was the, the only right target to set, given where, where the world was going and, and, uh, and the urgency of the climate crisis. Um, and we could see that obviously we had to change to a new fuel because while we had reduced our emissions by 46% per container moved at that time, we could also see that it didn't really didn't really bend the overall curve because we were also growing as a company. So while energy efficiency is important and, and something where, where we have, I think we have gained some, some ground over the last few decades, uh, we need to change fuels to get to zero, zero uh, quite obviously. So we've been looking into to various sources of fuels, various types of fuels. We are we are still in that process, I would say, um, and um, and and we now have have this uh, uh, short list. You can say of what we think are the most likely fuels for shipping in the future. Uh, and uh, what we have here: green diesel, uh, green methanol, and green ammonia. Um, and I'm going to focus obviously most on green methanol today. But just to say that if you take the green diesel, uh, then of course, we have the, the, the green diesels that are available in the market today, um, but they are, are very scarce. It's very difficult to scale them, uh, and the prices we expect will go up quite soon. Actually, we, that begins to, to happen already. Uh, for green ammonia, uh, we think that's also going to be a fuel uh, for shipping in the future, but there are issues that need to be solved yet um, before, before that can become a reality with the engine, and we need a lot of procedures and especially safety procedures around ammonia to make it happen. But, but methanol um, is like a, like a sweet spot in the middle, I would say, where, um, where we think methanol is ready to scale now, and we think it has a high scale scalability potential. I'm not going to repeat what's, what's already been said by the other speakers, but I, but I agree to all of it. And it's, it's, it's great to be in a webinar like this, where I can say, yes, what, what, what the three uh, previous speakers said is actually the reasons, many of the reasons why we're going into methanol. Uh, methanol has a couple of different production pathways. There's a biomethanol, which is we think is probably going to be a transition type uh, green methanol, uh, because eventually a bio is going to get too expensive. Um, the e-methanol has long potential, we think, and e-methanol either from point source or from uh, direct air capture when, when that uh, technology matures, uh, is also, you can say, two ways of producing it. So, and it all uh, turns into the same molecule, which is very neat because then the engines and the ships will not need to change bases different types of methanol, which is actually super important. Um, but we've been talking to, to, uh, to potential methanol producers over the last couple of years, uh, including Liquid Wind uh, and, uh, and many others globally that are looking into developing methanol projects. What we could see was that there is this chicken and egg situation in the industry uh, which I think is quite normal when you get into to new technologies uh, where, you know, we didn't have a ship that could burn methanol and uh, what characterized uh, all of the potential fuel producers was that they could not scale production unless they had a firm long-term offtake agreement with someone like us so that they could go to the investors and say, we have a customer, let's start producing. Um, and that was what that situation uh, led us to, to what I think you mentioned, uh, Randall, that we have uh, taken a few decisions this year to try and get the ball rolling on methanol as a fuel for shipping. Um, we ordered one ship uh, earlier in the year, uh, I think it was back in June, which will need uh, 10,000 ton of, uh, of green methanol. Uh, and, uh, and for that ship, um, which is a smaller uh, feeder vessel that's going to be, be, be trading in Northern Europe, uh, we have secured the green methanol from a green uh, an e-methanol uh, production facility that will be built in Denmark actually. Uh, secured doesn't mean that we have it in a tank somewhere and it's ready for the ship. It just means that we made a contract and now they are actually beginning to build the plant. So there's still a lot of uncertainties in this, but this is what we can do to, to get the ball rolling. Uh, then uh, later in the year in August, we ordered eight more uh, container vessels. And the first one was, you can say, pilot scale container ship. Then uh, that we did just to, to get moving on methanol. Then the eight ones here are a, a regular replacement order where we, as we will from now on, say that when we order new ships, we will do them dual fuel with a green fuel uh, option as well. For these ships, we need uh, 300,000 tons of green methanol. So this is a completely different 
uh, board game we're getting into, and we are in talks with many different uh, potential customers, uh, uh, not customers, suppliers of fuel for this. Uh, but it's clearly a challenge uh, to, to get the green fuel uh, for these ships. Uh, that was also the whole purpose for, for actually making this move was to, to get the production going. But uh, as soon as you make the ship order, you know there will be two, three years to, till you get the ship. And this clock starts ticking on, on the green methanol production because the production is not there today. The global production, to our knowledge, is around 30,000 tons of green methanol today. It's not being used in shipping. It's being used, I believe, in the, in the plastics industry. We need 10 for the first, um, first vessel in, in 23. And then by the end of 2024, 20, uh, we need uh, around three time, uh, 10 times the, the current production. So we need to 10x global methanol, green methanol production within three years. Uh, and that is still our what we're aiming for. But... Uh, and while I think that the pipeline, the longer pipeline actually looks quite healthy, uh, there's a lot of projects out there that are coming up. Uh, of course, 2024 is a stretch and that's just the way it is. Um, I'll stop it there and so that we can get into the interactive part, but, uh, but thanks a lot. Excellent, thank you, Jakob. And I think those last few slides are very useful for illustrating um, the size of the industry versus the side of production where we are now and where we need to be. Um, if we're looking at the um, uh, number of plants that Liquid Wind is, is creating, the 500 plants um, could potentially be 5% of the fuel mix, but, uh, but we have to be aware that um, um, you know, it's not 50, right? So, so um, uh, everything that Liquid Wind can do uh, would be needed along with everything that 1.5 can do if we're really going to be able to scale this up with double digits. And I think as we, we've all mentioned, there's open questions in terms of the, the, the long-term costs and how these compare, especially with ammonia as we look for decarbonization. So, um, and, and, and Jakob, as you pointed out that uh, you're looking not just at methanol, but of course at the, the, the uh, full spectrum of, of available green fuels. Um, so I, I think this takes us to one question, maybe just kind of to come back to, to the group, because a, a couple of you, um, uh, Carolina and Jakob, you both mentioned this idea of, of, of blending. And I think one of the important things uh, that we see around methanol is that um, to overuse the colors, there is brown methanol that exists. It comes from oil. Um, it uh, can be replaced by green methanol at a certain level of scalability. And that allows us to have a transition where we can have blends in between. And now there's some prerequisites for that. So you need your um, uh, um, a, 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 a book and claim system or some sort of system in, in, in place um, to do that. But um, maybe Jakob, first to you, um, how are you knowing what is green when you're buying? And then Caroline, to you, um, uh, what does the blending look like and how does this change um, what you're doing and how it goes, uh, goes to market? So Jakob, to start with you on that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, um, as, as mentioned, there's no there's no market today for, for green methanol. So, and there's not and, and there's not going to be production without without offtake. And what we can also see is that that for us to get get to production to get to scale, we will we will actually need to engage quite deeply with all of these suppliers. And part of that is naturally to look at the full life cycle uh, of uh, of these fuels. Uh, there's no uh, there's no simple answer to what that looks like because it's all very entrepreneurial, but but we'll be looking at, uh, I mean, we'll only be looking at shades of green methanol, if you will. We'll not be looking into gray or blue methanol, which is also, or even pink methanol. We'll, we'll be looking at the green um, the green methanol, so biomethanol and the e-methanol, basically. And, and the reason why we are that strict about it is really that this is also about building a new industry. And, uh, and I think we do that best and we push that uh, development best by focusing only on green and, and sending a very clear signal to those wanting to produce green or, or, or alternative methanol, methanol, if you will, that that's what we're looking for. And we're not planning to blend uh, 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 fossil methanol with, with green methanol. We're going to, to try and only use green and, and then have diesel as a fallback uh, or maybe biodiesel on these ships. Uh, but, uh, but yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Jakob. Um, Carolina, do you want to take that as well? Yeah, and I think, uh, I mean, from our our side, when it comes to production, it won't have a difference. We are still only going to produce uh, the green methanol um, based on biogenic sources and, and renewable uh, electricity. Uh, but what I meant there is, is more that it, 
also connecting to to what Jacob talked about with the chicken and the egg. So, for example, mm -hmm. while waiting for for green methanol uh, in large volumes, um, chipping companies can actually use fossil methanol and blend green methanol yeah. in a smoother transition. Um, but we no, still have sense. our focus on, on green methanol. Yeah, okay, no, that, that makes sense. And I, and I think the same, of course, would apply for ammonia and other alternate fuels that have a um, multiple colored uh, variants of them. Um, and, and I'm gonna do a shameless plug for our next webinar is actually gonna be looking into um, LCA and the different colors of fuels because we, we use green, we use brown, we use uh, blue, um, but clearly um, even here, we've already noted that when we're talking about green, it's not necessarily 100% green because there's gonna be a little bit of slip here and there. There's also gonna be the transport costs and other things. So we'll, in two weeks time, we'll be having a webinar looking at some of those other things as we define fuels and define the colors behind them and the actual LCA. So I think that's gonna be something important with that. Um, it's easy to generalize when we talk about the greens and the blues, but, um, but uh, there's a long-term need to be very uh, specific there. Um, there was a question in the chat that came through that was about kind of um, uh, why um, E or biomethanol is that more interesting than kind of uh, LNG for shipping? And just kind of one comment is that in, in our work and some of the work with the Center for Zero Carbon uh, shipping, um, uh, what we've seen is that uh, zero life cycle GHG LNG is going to be more expensive than methanol. Um, and so, so given that, uh, that UMass, uh, who we're working with very closely in, in the, the Center for Zero Carbon Shipping, have both found that ELNG is, um, is, is more expensive, are there other reasons to focus on kind of methanol rather than LNG as a future fuel molecule? And, and maybe Dolph will ask you to, um, to, to start with that. Um, well, I mean, if, if, if methanol is a liquid, uh, LNG is well a liquid gas, if you like. But but in in, in principle, I guess so, so. That makes that that the the the, uh, the handling of the gas is usually a little bit more complicated than the handling of the liquid, and and of course today's ships use liquid. So so uh, if, if you want to do something with today's ships. Uh, methanol is, is the easier solution. If you go down the, the, the LNG road, um, there, there is, uh, well, of course, LNG reduces emissions compared to, to the, the bunker fuel, uh, but uh, there is some concern about upstream uh, methane emissions. Uh, and uh, if you have to use uh, biomethane or, or synthetic uh, methane, then the conversion efficiency comes into play, which is a little, the losses are a little bit higher than for methanol, and and and, and of course you you, uh, um, yeah, maybe I stop there. I mean, it it get, it gets quite, <laughs> quite quite technical uh, uh, this comparison. Okay, no, that's fine, and that wasn't the goal of this webinar, but I think it's just useful for people to have that in mind that ships are running on liquid fuels. So methanol from an infrastructure perspective is uh, closer than uh, a gaseous fuel, but then also looking at that full uh, life cycle, that upstream, the role of methane slip, there's other reasons as well. So that's one of the, those are a few of the reasons why uh, methanol is so popular. I'd like to um, shift the conversation a little bit to the cost and most importantly, how to bring those costs down. Um, uh, Rob, you mentioned um, a, a couple of numbers. I'd love for you to, reiterate for the audience, what is the future scenario? What's an optimistic scenario for 1.5 in terms of the, um, the long-term costs of, uh, of carbon and, and therefore of methanol? Um, and critically, what would it take you to get there? Um, what is it, uh, the demand is gonna be key, but I imagine that there's gonna be some other pieces in the policy landscape that uh, in the technology development that are gonna be needed. It'd be great to hear from you. What are those future costs potentially and how are we gonna get there? How are you gonna get there? Yeah, thanks, Randall. Uh, I, I think the, the best way to drive costs down is doing, right? And so, you know, that's why we're stepping up and, and going to be building the, the first of a kind 1 million metric ton per year facility. And just put that in perspective, you know, that's about a, a million tons of methanol that could potentially be used by Mercs to, uh, if we converted all of that, so to speak, to methanol. Now, what in the United States, the policy landscape is different than Europe, and I, I think in a little, little, in some ways, a little bit more progressive. So, it, the, how we're how we're financing this first facility? There's something called 45Q, 
And then there's something called the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard. And uh, we take CO2 out of the atmosphere and we sequester that in, in, with a permanent certification from the California Air Resources Board. And so we're working on that. That provides a revenue stream, at, at least as a backstop. Now, if there are businesses that are willing to step up and take products, uh, we, you know, we can build a, a liquid fuel facility and tag it on right on, on the back end of the director capture facility. Our intention is not to build one of these director capture plants, but following what's called Wright's Law, which is well known in the, in the world. That is, if you learn by doing. And so we're, we're, uh, we expect after seven generations, by the end of this decade, we'll drive the cost down at least 50%. And if you look at the paper that was published by Carbon Engineering in the journal Juul, uh, it, uh, by David Keith and uh, several, several people from Carbon Engineering, they said the price range would be between 93 and I don't know, what, what did they say, $220. And, and we believe that we'll be able to fit within that window uh, by the end of the decade. And at that point, then, then director capture becomes very interesting. Do you make products? Do you use it to uh, you know, provide a credit scheme of some sort? Uh, and I think it, it's, it's, a, it's a very versatile product that you can do. And, and going to air to fuels where you can bolt on a, uh, a liquid fuel uh, product. I think there's a lot of new tech out there. But when you look at a financeable product, you need to have people that are already doing it big. And so there's big electrolysis guys out there now. You don't need to come up with a new tech. You need to partner with the right electrolysis folks. You know, you know doing Fisher Tropes or methanol production. Uh, there's, there's people out there with catalyst packages that are willing to step up and, and backstop, so to speak, that, that product. And so uh, we announced uh, a project up in Canada, for example, where we're doing an air to fuels, taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, using hydropower from British Columbia. And uh, make it, we're basically, in that case, make, using a Fisher Tropes process to provide an e-diesel to uh, uh, some customers up there. Uh, and it, uh, we're doing, you know, feed is really being sponsored by the uh, government of Canada at that point. So there's, a, you know, we're, we're starting to touch around the world. We had did some announcements over in the UK. I think there's a, with um, uh, some projects there and some other ones we're talking around the world. Every, everybody's interested in different solutions, right? They want Some people want to have the direct air capture CO2 sequestered underground. Some people are interested in a, a liquid fuel product. Um, and it, 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 some people are interested in uh, um, uh, converting that CO2 into chemicals even, right? So everybody has a different solution or different need. And, uh, you know, here in the, in the maritime field, uh, you know, they're, they're looking for liquid hydrocarbon fuels that are drop-in replacements. That's the best. And if you can make that net zero, all the better. Does that make sense, Randall? I said, answer your question or no? It, and no, it certainly does. I mean, I think one of the key things that my takeaways from that point is that, um, there's actually a lot of demand for um, uh, for CO2 that has been drawn down from the atmosphere, and that can be, as you indicated, that you can get paid to put that underground and permanently sequester it. Um, and in some ways, it'll be interesting because shipping actually has to com compete with that in some ways. So there's there's already a price on that in certain uh, jurisdictions, and uh, and so one of the questions ends up being how low can the can that cost come down, and what does that look like, and then what does it get used for? Um, uh, Carolina, from your side, um, how does this get to scale? So you you had some uh, some ambitious numbers that uh, they could take you to a, a percentage of the of the maritime industry, and that's your your sole focus. Um, how will you be able to meet those? Um, it, it'll take more than Ameris, but what's going to get the other companies to create that demand, and what's going to allow you to bring down the cost of your technologies? Good question, and thank you. <laughs> I think uh, I mean. We need to create demand, uh, and I, I think I would actually like to sort of direct this in a in a policy way. So, from my point of view, I think we need to to make sure that decision makers uh, enable for this kind of scale up uh, for for renewable fuels like e-methanol. Uh, first of all, I think it's very important that decision makers make sure there is fair and clear definitions of of renewable fuels. Uh, so for example, ensuring a well-to-wake well approach that this is adopted, where we take into account all the emissions and impacts from the entire value chain. This is first point. Second point is that 
yes, we can create demand, of course, without policy instruments, but that would not be a that would not be fast enough. So we definitely need policy instruments to fasten the transition. Um, so for example, policy instruments such as ETS, CO2 taxation, etc. And third, I would like to say also the production or the cost in the beginning now will be higher, just as also uh, Dolph mentioned earlier today. Uh, but for this, beginning, we need financial support to lower the gap uh, between higher production costs and also the willingness to pay, um, making sure that the industry are able to actually sort of kickstart the transition. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Carolina. Um, and so the, the, the role of that demand, Jakob, will bring us back to you. Uh, two questions to you. One, there was a uh, I think a little clarification on on how your dual fueled ships will run, and I, and I think that might um, be useful for you to answer reasonably quickly. That was a question in the chat saying that um, if there's not sufficient green methanol when uh, when the vessels are coming online, what is their alternate fuel? Is it going to be um, brown, uh, so we'll just say non green methanol, or is it going to be a um, a mix of traditional fuels? So maybe a quick uh, clarification on the. Um, uh, on the dual fuel engines and, and, and what the, what the mm -hmm. options are there. Um, if you could start with that, but then I'd, I'd like to have a follow-up question with you um, around uh, the role of policy in this space as well. So maybe to answer that first yeah. question. Sure. So, so, uh, so a dual fuel is basically an engine that has two different uh, fuel uh, and tank systems uh, that will, that, that can, can be used with the engine. So you can switch from, uh, green methanol and and to diesel and back again in principle. Uh, the ships are, are are designed for that because then then we have certainty that we will be able to operate these ships. And I think it's a very very good technology. So actually, you can see say that the 10 15 percent that it costs extra to have this dual fuel capability on a ship uh, is almost like an insurance premium because then our risk of ending up with a stranded asset that could only run on fossil is much lower. Uh, so I think that's where it starts. Then of course it is our ambition to run them uh, on, on on green methanol, so they will be ideally running on probably 95% uh, green methanol and then roughly 5% uh, biodiesel as a as a pilot fuel or ignition fuel as it's called. Um, but if uh, for for some reason there would be no uh, green methanol ready from day one, we would run them on on diesel or biodiesel and then switch as soon as we can as soon as supply comes available. These ships are going to be in operation for over 20 years. Uh, so, so in the bigger scheme of things, uh, uh, even a year delay uh, uh, would be okay. We would hate it. We would hate to see it uh, because we want to, to, to meet the deadlines we have set up for ourselves, but we are trying to do something here that is actually super hard uh, and, uh, and, and we, will, we will simply try our best. Um, but, uh, but yes, it's good to have a fallback option on the engine uh, that, that, so you can run on diesel. And I think that's for other ship owners would might be a good choice as well uh, when we go into this. I think it will be the same with, with ammonia. When we get to that, that will also be a dual fuel engine. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that was that was the answer to your first uh, question. Then you had a- It was, and I, and I just want to quickly comment on that, so, which I think is very interesting because yeah. what we're seeing is the importance of creating that demand of not just the near-term lowering of carbon emissions. So mm -hmm. mass could lower its carbon emissions by um, uh, running just on uh, the biodiesel, for example, but that doesn't create the demand for the newer technologies. And I think that that's important exactly. that, um, that, that yes. we're really talking about this demand signaling that's, uh, that's so important. Yeah, the, the, sorry, the second question that I wanted to ask you was just related to the infrastructure investments that are required um, yeah. to scale. And yeah. how are you looking at that? Because uh, we heard from, from Rob and from Carolina uh, what they're looking at um, and in terms of the enablers on policies, but what are the infrastructure um, requirements that you see in terms of the scales that you're looking at? For, for methanol, it's, a, it's actually, it's more a, a scaling issue than it's more than it's a development issue because there are infrastructure available where you can, where you can bunker ships on, on methanol uh, ship to ship and there are procedures and all of that. But we can see that, um, that, that it needs to be scaled and it needs to be placed in the right places. I mean, when, and I, I really like, uh, the, the, the comment from from Rob that uh, you know how do you how do you get to scale and how do you get the cost down you just start doing it uh, because it's only when you start doing it that you actually find out what are the questions you need to have answers to and and one of the things that we are now trying to all the questions we're trying to answer is so 
how do we convince someone to come with a bunker bath uh, with a, uh, when there's only one customer per month in a certain port? Because that's the situation when we come with the first uh, methanol ship. And this is, you know, it's just an example of, you know, we need to build up the infrastructure that the oil industry uh, for for the for the you can say fuel oil. Uh, um, industry, if you will, have built up over 100 years as demand slowly increased. Now we need to flip from 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 fossil to green over much much shorter time. So so there will be infrastructure build up needs across the globe. We're trying to focus as narrowly as we can to start with, and and with container ships we have the benefit that uh, container ships they go like a bu like buses on a route, right? So they always come back to the same ports and typically. Ships are designed to go a full round trip, which means we just need one point on the journey where we can bunker the ship with this green methanol to get started. But and that's where it starts, and then it needs to spread from there so that that other shipping segments also can can be certain that they can get access to the fuels. Thank you, Jakob. And I think that's a really important point. This idea of um, with a lower energy density, what does that mean for actual refueling options? What does it mean for the behavioral yeah. changes in terms of how you operate a fleet? Um, how many times you need to refuel during a round trip, uh, whether that's yeah. less than one or whether that's uh, obviously moving towards more than one. Um, uh, the, uh, what I'd like to do is just, um, we've talked about kind of the biogenic and the, and the different sources. Dolph, from your perspective, I'd love to um, uh, you had your slides about kind of the availability of biogenic uh, CO2. Um, and I, I'd just be curious about the evidence that the supply chains um, that uh, collect CO2 from biogenic point sources, um, connecting these to actual fuel synthesis. What does IRENA see as the possibility for that? And what are the competitors uh, for those streams, including uh, potentially sequestration? How do you see that playing out in terms of the scalability on that end? Well, it's, it's still uh, very early days. There, there are very few uh, biomass CO2 capture projects at the moment. Uh, they're also uh, very diverse. I mean, th th there is the, the, the uh, let's say, uh, larger plants, say, say black liquor boilers, pulp, pulp, paper and pulp mills, and uh, etc. Maybe here and there, an, an, an uh, waste incineration plant, um, it's not so clear what's going to happen with large scale biomass power generation. Of course, there is the Drex uh, uh, example in, 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 in Europe, but uh, there's also quite a lot of pushback against large scale biomass uh, uh, power generation. So, um, the, I mean, for, from a systems perspective, it doesn't really matter. Huh? I mean, you can capture the CO2 from your biomass plant, put it on the ground and somewhere else, capture CO2 from a steel plant and put it into your methanol. And if you have a proper accounting system in place, that can count as biomass uh, 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 CO2 sourcing. But then the accounting needs to be in place. Right now, I, I don't think such accounting systems uh, exist. Uh, so, um, and, and, and yeah, let, let, let's a bit see how this, uh, how this develops going forward. Great, thanks Dolph. And um, thank you for everybody who's putting questions in the chat. Uh, thank you Jakob for answering some of them um, and for being able to multitask here. A question just came in that asked how green is e-methanol? I think this is an important one. It asks, do you need CCUS on board the vessel to really make it neutral? Um, uh, I'll answer that one. The answer to that is, is it depends on where your carbon comes from. So the whole point of this conversation has been around e-methanol using a carbon that uh, either came from the atmosphere um, through DAC, the direct air capture, or it came from the atmosphere um, um, and was brought into a biomass form by a plant, a tree, or something else like that. So in this case, what we're talking about is CO2 that came from the atmosphere, is being combined into this synthesized fuel, is being combusted and re-released to the atmosphere, but because it's being re-released to where it came from, we're talking about a net zero or very close to net zero. Um, the, uh, you therefore do not need carbon capture on board a vessel to make this, uh, this carbon neutral. Um, earlier in the conversation, I see that we're, we're getting close on time. Early in the conversation, we, had, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, cost and a lot of this uh, hinges, as Dolph pointed out, to, to open for us that there's two costs that are important. So one is the cost of the carbon that we're using and the other is the cost of the hydrogen. 
Um, we've also talked about kind of one of the long-term zero emission competitors for methanol. Uh, the, the big competitor I would say is ammonia. Um, does anybody on this call believe that as the cost for hydrogen come down, that the cost for methanol can, can beat ammonia? Do we think that that's actually possible uh, if you can kind of see both of those? And I know that, that it's kind of been modeled in different places, but I'm curious whether we think this or that methanol will always be kind of, uh, it's available now and it'll be second to ammonia in the longer term. I'm just curious, I'll, I'll open up on that. Uh, Jakob, you're unmuted, so I'm gonna start with you. Well, I mean, uh, I think that's a super good question. And I think this is, I mean, we just need to always remember to remind ourselves that this industry is in innovation mode when it comes to fuels and uh, and will be so for the next 10, 20 years. So what happens in that period, who knows? My, my personal guess would be that methanol will remain a little bit more expensive than ammonia uh, in the fuel production. But the big question mark is uh, what the total cost of operation, operation on methanol versus ammonia will be because ammonia will probably be more restricted or more difficult, at least in the first years. Uh, but that's the open question. So you can imagine that the production cost will be uh, methanol slightly higher than ammonia, but, but then in operation, the total cost where that will land, we'll, we'll have to see. Uh, that's why we're betting on both. Uh, we can start with methanol now. Uh, ammonia will hopefully come later and, uh, and we'll just see. And I can easily see those two fuels coexist also because there might be different production patterns, different regulations, uh, rules, whatever in the future that we would need to comply with. So, uh, so the area of, uh, or the era of one size fits all in shipping is certainly over, I think, uh, no matter who, who wins on the production cost. Great, thank you very much, Jakob. And, and, and uh, Rob, you pointed out earlier that the key thing is that we're actually doing this on the ground. We're learning by doing. Rights Rule is gonna allow us to bring those costs down uh, as we move forward, as we get the demonstrations on the ground and quickly move beyond demonstrations into the million ton sizes that you're talking about. Um, we have two minutes left. I'd love for each of our panelists to, um, to provide us with kind of some concluding remarks based on this conversation and based on your own experience. And as we're approaching the holiday season, let's just say you get your Christmas wish. Um, what does each of you need uh, to, to, to make this happen? Um, your, your one Christmas wish will go in order here. Um, uh, Dolph, then Rob, then Caroline, then Jakob. Many presents. <laughs> so let's try many things at the same time and see what works. Great, thank you. Rob? Yeah, I think that uh, we got the infrastructure bill passed through Congress, and so that's now law. Uh, the other thing is the reconciliation bill has a lot of climate improvements associated with that, and if that gets passed as it was passed through the House, would be a big boon to uh, developing direct air capture and many different CCUS technologies in the United States. Great. So role of policy there in promoting uh, CCUS to get it off the ground and into that scale. Carolina. So I would say also just uh, based on this call, I think continues to work, continue to work together to actually get this to happen and to be, make sure that we can start now. So we will reach economies of scale soon. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Carolina. And finally, Jakob, to you. Well, I actually believe I, I got an early or we got an early Christmas present today because I saw on the news that there was a, there was a charter, there was another ship owner that had, uh, had ordered, I think, 30 uh, small container ships to run on methanol. I think that was fantastic news. And I think that's exactly what we need. Uh, we, would we would love to see uh, more shipping companies uh, um, you know, coming, coming together with us, uh, really trying to make methanol as a future fuel reality. So, so yeah. That was the early Christmas gift. Uh, I'd like to have more of those. Excellent. Thank you. That takes us to the hour of fascinating conversation. Um, we heard all different facets of methanol, but we've heard that it's definitely a viable contender for part of the industry. It won't be able to do the whole industry, but it'll coexist next to ammonia and that crowding in new players, um, uh, uh, more demand as well as more supply is all going to be a good thing. So with that, thank you to Dolph, Rob, Carolina and Jakob for a great conversation. Um, for those of you that ask questions, thank you very much for participating. And for those that are listening, this uh, has been recorded. It will be posted online. And we look forward to more interesting conversations that will help us to decarbonize shipping. Thanks, all. <laughs>